I turn off my phone. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. In keeping with our tradition, we shall start with Karakia and then our brief Mihi Pakatau. Let us pray. Chainoi Tata. I'm Rukwe Hoi Toto Yamato, make a talk of where Nohoki Fakatahi Yamato. We are Nohoki Hayarahi Yamato. A nine eight in a wa, a rotu in Mahaura. Poto ten a. Eno e maki aku e tō mātou mātou i nei te rangi, ke whakatata mai ki a mātou. Uh, ki o mātou tō mātou whakaminenga. Ki o mātou kai mātou, ki a mātou kuia. A tai atu uh, ki ngā kaiwhakarite o tēnei kaupapa. E pā e tō mātou ariki, tuku no mai tō ringa mātou, ki ringa e tēnā me tēnā o mātou. Ka piki te ora, te kaha ki runga, ki roto i a mātou i nai nei, i ngā rangi i haere ake nei. E pai nei hoki te mahi atō mātou kai whakaora o i hukaraiti. Amine. Amine. <coughs> Akatira, uh, <coughs> ko te wehi kia i hoa ngā mano, nā te timatanga o te pakaaro nui. Uh, ka mihi rā uh, ki o tātou mā te huhua, uh, ngā mā te takato maina i runga i o koutou ngā marae maha. Uh, ka wea mai, uh, ki roto ki runga i tō tātou kāreti, uh, kia mihi a kia tangihia, a kia poroporo a ki hia, a rātou te hunga wahangu te a rātou. Haere, haere, moi mai rā i roto i ngā ringa ringa o te areki. Uh, ka hoki i ora mai, uh, kia tātou, he aku kaumātua, he aku pakete, he aku whaea, he tō tātou manukura, <laughs> Kei o tātou tua kana, e o tātou tungane, i roto ia kraiti ihu, nau mai rā, whakatau mai rā. Ah, he whakatau tēnei i runga <coughs> i ngā āhuatanga o tātou, a o tika ngā Māori. Ahakoa kāre pea e mohi ana a ki te reo Māori, a ko te mea nui, <coughs> e whae ana ngā tika ngā tātou mātua tika. Koutou i haere mai tawhiti. Koutou i haere mai uh, uh, i taranaki. Koutou i haere mai e waho atu o tāma ki makaurau. Haramai, haramai, haramai. Haramai uh, ki te whakarongo, uh, ki tō tātai rangatira, tāku tahamiora tēnā hui. Uh, mihi ana uh, <coughs> uh, ki tō tātai kaupapa, a me tō tātou a tātou kai whakariterite, a tākuta tōng, te ngā koe, a huri rauna i tō tātou whai. E, te ngā pakeke, te ngā kai whakarite i tēnei hui, i tēnei ahi pō, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, it's my honour and privilege uh, to, well, begin our hui with karakia, but also to welcome you. Um, in keeping with our tikanga Māori uh, tradition, uh, welcome you once, welcome you twice, welcome you three times. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kia ora tāte katoa. Uh, let me just add my welcome uh, to that of Te Hirapainga. Uh, my name is Tom Noakes Duncan, and I have the pleasure of introducing our Selwyn lecturer for 2022, Dr. Samuel Carpenter. Before I do so, though, I just want to um, uh, begin in prayer as Tehira has done also. So let us pray. God of the islands of the Southern Sea, of Māori and Pākehā and Polynesia, and of all who dwell in our lands. We give you thanks and praise for our various countries and peoples, for the land and sea, and the many gifts by which you sustain us. As we remember tonight the stories and personalities that both divide and bind, we ask that you increase our trust in one another. Strengthen our quest for your justice and bring us to unity and a common purpose. You have made us of one blood. Make us also of one mind. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
Good evening. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of our Manukura, uh, Katsini Iriwera, uh, the faculty and staff of St. John's, and our amazing students, I welcome you to what promises to be an illuminating, hopefully not too dry, <laughs> possibly provocative, <laughs> and certainly illustrious night together. Uh, we are in the company of some past Selwyn lecturers, and I recognize Ellen, Janet, uh, and others who have gone before us, whose scholarship have forged a path for many of us. To you, we give you thanks. Perhaps more important, however, we are in the company of some future Selwyn, lecturers. One of the good news stories of St. John's College, and despite the earnest efforts of some to drown out all the good news stories, <laughs> is the flourishing of theological scholarship at this college. As a new generation of faithful, articulate, and thoughtful leaders are wrestling with the pressing issues facing our church and society. You are the future and we are behind you. The Selwyn lectureship uh, began in 1965 as an initiative of the then Warden of St. John's, Raymond Foster, who proposed the idea of bringing a visiting scholar of international standing to lecture at St. John's and other places throughout the country, with a particular focus on themes relevant to New Zealand society and church. With the backing of the St. John's Trust Board, who hold all the putia, and the governors of the college, this lectureship has continued, albeit complemented by alternating between overseas scholars and those sons and daughters of these lands. After more than a few years, it feels, of disruption, we are grateful to see a return of this lectureship and a return of audiences who can listen and heckle in person. <laughs> Heckling over Zoom was just never the same, eh? <laughs> we are therefore excited uh, to invite Sam Carpenter to be our first post-pandemic Selwyn lecturer. <laughs> uh, Dr. Samuel Carpenter's formal designation is Research and Professional Teaching Fellow at Laidlaw College and Scholar in Residence at St. John's Theological College, which is just to say that both of our institutions claim Sam as our right. <laughs> Sam's PhD, uh, awarded last year by Massey University, focused on early political thought in Aotearoa, New Zealand, between 1814 and 1863 where he examined texts that reshaped ideas of political authority and community in British and Māori worlds, aiding Sam's encyclopedic knowledge of 19th century New, New Zealand texts. He also worked for over 10 years in, as a historian in the Wellington Treaty sector, including for the Waitangi Tribunal, the Office of Treaty Settlements, Te Arafiti, and the Crown Law Office. Kickstarting much of this work, however, as a professional historian, Sam was a founding trustee of Karufa Trust back in 2005. Since then, he has been facilitating pilgrimages to Waitangi annually and to other significant historical locations across the Motu in order that New Zealanders would come to better know the story they are part of. Born and bred in Tāmaki, we are grateful that this local son will be sharing part of a biography he is currently writing on the life of Henry Williams. The title of tonight's lecture, as is seen up there, is The CMS Mission at Paihia Te Whairangi, an analysis of gospel and culture in a revolutionary age. So, Almighty Pucky Pucky, let us put our hands together.
Kia ora tātou, <coughs> Mike Swerkin. Yeah, uh, tēnā koe uh, i te rangatira uh, te hira, uh, mō tō mihi uh, mai ki a hau, uh, ki a tātou uh, i tēnei, tēnei pō, uh, tēnā rā uh, ko koe uh, tāng. Uh, mō tō mihi kui. Um, e mihi mai hoana uh, ki a koutou katoa, uh, ngā rangatira, uh, ngā pūkinga, ngā kaiako, taurira, uh, o te kāne tēnei, uh, now, Manu Huri Hoki A uh, Kanoe to Mehi Hoki Kinga Huri or Napuhi A uh, Oti Mihingari A uh, Inoho Ita Kainga or Pai here A Wera to uh, Kainga or Ti Mihingari A uh, Inga Wa or Mua Tina Koto Kato I acknowledge and thank uh, Kartini and the College for the invitation to present this lecture. Um, tonight. Uh, also for the invitation more generally of the college to, to be at college, to, to live at college with my family and contribute to its research and teaching life. Uh, also, uh, I, I need to thank, I should thank uh, or acknowledge uh, Laidlaw College, uh, which has also enabled us to be back in Tāmaki Makoto uh, on this exciting venture, adventure that is uh, tertiary theological education. <laughs> uh, in, in my mihi, uh, just before I acknowledged, um, and I sp specifically want to acknowledge uh, the Udi, the descendants of those who are in some way connected with the kaupapa of my talk tonight, which is the Paihia mission in particular, but I suppose the CMS missions uh, of those early days. And I should just add that, in a sense, uh, this lecture is a combination of probably 20 years of journey uh, of going to the Bay of Islands, uh, uh, initially over Waitangi commemorations, uh, going back year on year. Um, and this, the site that I'm talking about still exists, obviously, it's still there. It's just surrounded by mot motels, mostly. Um, but there's still the church, uh, St Paul's. There's still uh, the Wahi Tapu, the, the grave, grave site, and then a little piece that's been preserved of the original mission site, um, William Williams' house, which is um, stone ruins, still remnants of that. And a lemon tree, uh, or a lemon tree that's been regrown from an original lemon tree planted by Henry Williams um, way back <laughs> in the 1820s. So that's probably one of the oldest lemon trees in the country. <laughs> So a few years ago, the acclaimed Indian novelist Amitabh Ghosh stated in an interview, to inhabit a place is to be able to see it, to experience it through one's senses, to eat its foods, breathe its smells, rest one's eyes on its sights. So I ask, uh, if the good historical novel, why not the closely observed cultural history? But how can we imaginatively inhabit the life, the culture of the Paihia mission at a distance of 200 years? Well, we have detailed contemporary sketches, amazing first hand observations, uh, richly detailed institutional records such as the baptism registers now housed digitally at our very own kinder library, and something historians call context. My analysis today will show that mission life was filled with almost ceaseless prayer, a translation work, printing, teaching and catechizing, talking, hosting, eating, debating, counselling, building or appearing, going out and returning, writing and reporting, peacemaking at home, and mediating abroad. Sometimes, many of those at the same time, which is why Henry Williams often complained that he could never quite focus on any one thing at once. Mm -hmm. As Tony Ballantyne has shown, these were not islands of England behind white picket fences. So my question in this lecture reflects the complexities of culture and ideas the lived experience of people in societies or communities. To understand culture, we need something like the approach of the anthropologist Clifford Getz, 
um, who famously advanced the methodology of thick description. Only by closely or thickly describing social practices and institutions can we see underlying patterns and presuppositions, namely culture. Culture, to employ another Gertzian metaphor, are those webs of significance in which people are suspended, along which they move. Thus, the analysis of culture is a search for meaning, an interpretive exercise. What I've decided to do is structure my description of the Pahia mission around a week, a representative week, uh, in which each of the seven days represents a key activity, task or mahi, uh, most of which would have been carried out the bulk of the week anyway, uh, apart from the Sabbath. But firstly, I begin with some necessary prologue. When the southern Bay of Islands, probably Ngāti Hine Rangatira, Te Kōki sent his son to stay with Samuel Marston in Parramatta, New South Wales. He, sent, he set in train a series of events that were to change the history of the Bay of Islands and New Zealand. Like many Māori who went to stay with Marston through the period of the 1810s to 30s, Te Kōki's son was of chiefly lineage, and he went there to learn Marston's arts of civilization, so called. Uh, agriculture and cropping techniques, artisan trade skills, and the new political knowledge and religion of the Pākehā. Sadly, uh, Tōki's son died in New South Wales. Some scholars have seen the presence of Henry and Mary Ann Williams at Pākehā as Utu, or a return for the death of Te Ahara in Parramatta. Uh, certainly, Tōki had requested a missionary, a request that was to become common, of course, at this period among Māori uh, through the country. So the ship Brampton, carrying the Williams and Fairburn families, Samuel Marston, and a wider contingent that included the Wesleyan missionaries, um, Reverend Nathaniel Turner, Reverend John Hobbs, arrived in the Bay of Islands in early, early August 1823. At this time, Henry was aged around 31 and Mary Ann 29, and their three children were all under five years old, and Mary Ann was expecting. Uh, Williams and Sarah Furbion, with two children, were probably of a similar age. I think it's important we remember how young these people were. William Williams, when he turned up, the brother, younger brother, a few years later, he was only 26, with his wife. So Mary Ann and children stayed at Kitty Kitty. Oh, well, Henry and William Fairburn, a carpenter and catechist, went to arrange housing. There was an existing um, Māori kāinga at Paihia, possibly a seasonal fishing site or gardens, although the soil in many places was poor. Uh, William, Williams and Fairburn ate their meals with the hapu around an open fire. In September 1823, Henry purchased the island Mōwhirangi from Te Kōki and in a separate translate transaction acquired nine acres of what was designated to Corky's farm, the land that became the mission settlement. While to was considered the patron, Mary Ann calls him our head chief. His wife, Hamu, was a customary owner of Pai here in her own right. One authority suggests that the coastal lands from Pai here to Kawakawa were controlled by to at this period. And at this time, the 1820s to 40s, the iwi that was to later become known as Ngāpui uh, was divided between a northern alliance represented by Pongi Hika and a southern alliance uh, of whom leading chiefs were Pomari at Otiihu uh, across the harbour and Ngāti Hini chiefs around Kawakawa, including Tukoki. The northern alliance only was known as Ngāpui by the missionaries at this period. It's interesting to note that. Um, these hapu alliances were to battle, uh, literally, over control of the, of the European trade, especially that trade centred on Kororarika, uh, home of a few respectable settlers, but many more escaped convicts uh, and ships crews, and of course, local Māori. So Pōmari and company lost out to the northern group, Ngāpui, um, or Ngāpui proper, uh, in 1830 and resettled at Motiuhu, further down the harbour, where he established his own trading centre. When you read the accounts of 
the, these first um, meetings between um, the set of missionaries and, and Māori, um, particularly in accounts of Mary Ann Williams, there, there's just a real, a real energy that that sort of sparkles off the page. And lots of amazing little incidents, including this one. So uh, when they first arrived at Nangihaua, so before Pai here, little Edward Williams, who was around five, um, hung in or rubbed her noses, as his mother recorded, with one or two tattooed heroes. Uh, and the three Williams children distributed raisins among the little New Zealanders. Uh, now it's necessary to pause here. New Zealanders simply meant uh, the people native to New Zealand. Uh, the other common rendering was the natives. Uh, Māori, which was a later name or usage, um, was an extension of the idea of ordinary or natural and thus native to the country. Um, so natives became, or native became Māori later on. I'm sure most of you know that, but important to know. Um, Mary Ann Williams' account of the welcome she received on her arrival at Paihia uh, is heartwarming. The beach was crowded with natives. With great glee, they drew me up while I was sitting in the boat, exclaiming te wahine, and holding out their hands, saying, Kina rā ko koe, homai te ringaringa. How do you do? Give me your hand. I cannot describe my feelings. I trembled and cried, but joy was the predominant feeling. She had recorded earlier, I felt a further, fervent thankfulness that we had been brought and had been permitted to bring our little ones to this scene of labour. She also wrote that from the stories she had been told by missionary wives already there, and she did not consider there was any cause for future personal dread, though there was the greatest need of missionary labour and earnest prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So Tukoki's people constructed the first house for the Williams and Fabian families, a traditional, well, a funny, certainly built of traditional materials known as the beehive uh, due to its appearance. The Williams portion was fitted out with uh, a green tent canvas on the walls and white calico hanging from the ceiling. Uh, Marianne Williams, according to Angela Middleton, was focused on establishing English domestic practices and routines, including ironing, believe it or not, the bed linen and clothing. <laughs> and building a church, if a temporary one, was a priority. The week after Marianne arrives, um, a Rauport chapel with a sash window and a wooden floor was ready for Samuel Marsden to preach on. So Paihe was the third mission settlement after we're here in Angihawa in 1814 and Kirikiri in 1819. Uh, Te Waimati followed in 1831. Uh, the mission farm became the first site, of course, of Salmon St. John's College in the early 1840s before moving here a couple of um, years after that. So, who was living here at Pai here? Who was part of this community? In short, there were ordained missionaries and catechists with their families, um, artisans such as blacksmiths and carpenters, Māori chiefs, their servants or slaves, and various other Māori children and adults from the local hapu and from iwi further afield. Many of these originally war captives. It's difficult to get the proportion of these uh, accurately. Uh, but we know that there were many uh, persons of rank among their number, uh, including slaves who were people of rank as well, not just um, local Ngāpui people. So the mission um, grew into a sizable settlement. In 1831, the Paihia resident population was recorded as 238, uh, consisting of 155 Māori, 29 missionaries and 54 missionary children, a ratio of Māori to Europeans of approximately two to one. And at school examination time, the annual examinations depicted here, the population swelled temporarily um, to a thousand or more. <clears throat> 
this was one of the main events in the calendar or became such, believe it or not, the school examinations. <laughs> we know that there were considerable slaves from Hongi Hitler's campaigns who ended up uh, at the Paihia mission. Um, total numbers of captives brought back to Northland probably numbered in the low thousands in total, not at the mission. Uh, some of Tepoki's slaves from the wars uh, were in the mission's employ, uh, and other Māori who were in the settlement, uh, who were people of rank, had their own slaves also. Now, there was a, perhaps a certain lack of defini definition over who was a slave, a redeemed slave, or simply a servant in the employ of the mission. Uh, but we should remember that everyone worked um, in this community. There was no avoiding chores of some kind. <laughs> Um, inside the mission, certainly, slaves had more chance of escaping the harsher punishments. The treatment of slaves as concubines or chiefs also ran up against the mission's marriage sanctions. Uh, on one occasion, Henry Williams carefully remonstrated with a native of rank who had been accepted into the settlement. Uh, he was, quote, ill-treating his wife and had brought two slave girls within the fence. The, the implication is, as his lovers. So the tapu was an ever-present law for Rangatira, which sometimes uh, presented uh, basic conundrums over how to act. Uh, for example, um, in February 1824, Mary Ann Williams recorded, uh, one morning at breakfast, uh, Tukorki, so their patron, having drunk a large basin of tea, requested that his kuki or cook uh, might never be allowed to drink out of the same. And Mrs. Fairbairn told us that if he knew such to be the case and were afterwards taken ill, he would immediately kill the poor girl. So the mission was quick to perceive these social distinctions while often in disagreement with the rules of tapu that supported them. Now, certain laws of tapu, I should underline, were observed, uh, for, for example, uh, wahi tapu or burial sites. Uh, but such laws of tikanga were also resisted where they would lead to muru or plundering raids on mission property or persons. This was a fine a balance to walk. Uh, such tikanga also became Christianized. Uh, in an off quoted uh, example, Honi Heke, no less, uh, stopped a group of women carrying food uh, through the mission settlement on a Sunday. Uh, now, presumably, this was because it would break the tapu of the Sabbath, uh, although. It's a bit unclear whether uh, that's because it was food and thus would make no other tapu, or because such activity constituted work. Um, it's a little bit unclear. In other respects, including assembly and worship and at schooling, the mission treated all alike. As Williams observed in December 1827, men, women and children, the gentry of the different orders and their slaves all are on one footing with us and classed together according to their knowledge. So this was the beginnings of a new type of society, both at prayer and in the classroom. There was equality of treatment and access to, to new knowledge and literacy. In some, this was a, a revolutionary change. Uh, and this is why many highborn chiefs initially they stood aloof from the mission uh, for, some, you know, for some time because it breached the sacrosanct rules of tapu by which their social and political status was supported. In 1833, for example, Williams recorded Tariha's adverse reaction to statements in the liturgy that all persons were equally sinful and in need of God's salvation. Thus, the gospel of salvation and, and mission practice by treating people as um, equally valuable human beings, equal in value, at least, if not in status, uh, had the effect of breaking down tapu rules and in time, uh, social distinctions of rank or class. Now that might not have been the intent, but it certainly was an effect that has been noted by historians. So now I turn to what I promised to do, which was a week in the life of a pioneer mission. Day one, Sabbath rest. 
So the book of Hebrews uh, in the New Testament states that there will be a Sabbath rest for the children of God. The practice of the Sabbath points, therefore, both forwards to eternity and backwards to the first Sabbath when the Creator rested from creation labor. The practice of the Sabbath was one of the key emphases of missionary teaching, and it was probably the practice that most defined the whole weekly cycle. So it makes sense to start the week here. Um, in addition, Sabbath, the Sabbath was one of the first Christian practices to be observed by the Māori community of the wider Paihe area. Now, the Sabbath, of course, was significant for evangelicals. Uh, William Wilberforce understood it as a time for, quote, exercises of humble admiration and grateful homage to God. The CMS in 1810 instructed its missionaries to observe the Sabbath strictly as of utmost importance for the promotion of individual and national piety. Observance of the Sabbath, including singing, this is the instruction, was to be publicly practiced and known uh, by the people round about. In the early 19th century, David Bogue, a dissenter, uh, noted how the Puritans were persecuted in Elizabethan England for, among other things, maintaining the holiness of the day uh, when some Londoners were happier to attend beer baiting. So the evangelical revival of the 18th century, of which the CMS was one expression, probably did much to restore the practice of Sabbath. For the CMS missionaries in New Zealand, the idea and practice of Sabbath also appears central to the meaning of the gospel. That the Sabbath rest pointed to, perhaps even represented, that peace with God that had been made possible through the Eucharist. This message of Sabbath rest and peace with God also shaded into the idea of reconciliation with enemies. On a Sunday in March 1830, in endeavouring to assist mediation in a tribal conflict, Henry Williams recorded that he spoke to parties at Kurorareka, quote, upon their present state, and offers of eternal peace held out by Jesus Christ. All were inclined for peace. In the evening, service as usual. Liwa and Farela, he came from the park, apparently under much concern by the delay in making peace. So the conjunction here of ideas of eternal peace and temporal peace making um, is quite um, evident. While they were fascinated early on by the practice of Sabbath, in 1828, Williams recorded a visit to Kawaka when Māori, quote, inquired when the Sabbath was to see if their calculation was right. It was so, at which they were much pleased. They said they understood when the Sabbath arrived, but they could not comprehend the nature of our religion. By 1833, our chiefs not known for their Christian observance were beginning to observe Sabbath. Uh, T. Tori, for one, declined to ship his goods on a European vessel on a Sunday uh, because it was the Ratabu. And Williams recorded with his language ironic, as it sometimes is in these situations. He said, We find the heathens, that is the chiefs, preaching to a Christian, the captain, calling his attention to the command of heaven. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The reply of this Christian was that they were not missionaries and did not regard these things. So Judith Binney and others have noted that by 1840, biblical metaphors and rituals, notably the Sabbath, have been interwoven with Māori thought and community life. They also suggest that the scriptural translations uh, use Māori words such as tapu, karakia and atua in interesting ways, and that this helped to indigenise the faith. This argument bears comparison, I think, to Laman Sane's argument that the act of translation into an indigenous language is itself a process of indigenization in which two things are going on. The scripture is remaking or remolding indigenous concepts, but at the same time has been reshaped by those concepts. So a world, this Māori world, structured by deep concepts of tapu, mana and utu, was being remade through new practices of tapu, principally the Sabbath. Uh, 
Day two, mediating and peacemaking. So peace with God and reconciliation with enemies was perhaps the central message of the early missions. But it's interesting to know that the activity of peacemaking itself uh, still had to observe God's order of priorities as the missionaries understood them. And that included observing the Sabbath itself. So I have a prominent example of this. Um, Pongihaka died in 1828. And despite warnings from Māori and, mis and missionary fears, the mission stations were not plundered uh, by Tawamuru in response to the significant unbalancing in the Tapu order of things. The day that Williams was able to confirm that Pongi Hiki had, had actually died, um, there were reports that the son of a senior rangatira Pomari was killed at Hokianga on a Tawamuru. As a result, five of the Hokianga people were killed uh, in recompense. There were further retaliatory engagements, um, uh, and the high ranking Bay of Islands rangatira Te Whare Umu was killed <laughs> along with others. So at this point, um, senior rangatira from both northern and southern alliances of the bay requested missionary assistance to mediate peace with the Hokianga people. And Williams recorded in March 28 that the tribes were aware that much evil will befall them if they fight, and yet by their law they are required to avenge the death of Whareumu. They cannot make peace of themselves, but should we also go, they may be able to accomplish it. So Williams, um, George Clark, and others accompanied Ngāpui and then towards Hokianga where the peace was negotiated. This is where the Sabbath comes in. The missionaries counseled delay until the Monday so the Sabbath could be kept. You might think that peacemaking was important enough to carry on, but, <laughs> but no, Sabbath had to be observed. <clears throat> so on the Monday, so the Sabbath was observed, and on the Monday, Williams and Clark acted as go-betweens to bring the two sides together onto neutral ground marked by a white flag, the use of which was common in peacemaking. I think it's important not to overstate the role missionaries played in tribal mediation. There were often reasons in Tikanga and Whakapapa to make peace, to fight on risk more deaths, which would require additional butu to rebalance the situation. Yet the role of missionaries as neutral parties was often a key factor in enabling peace negotiations. In this Hokianga instance, this was quite a critical moment in, in the history of the North at this juncture. The chiefs could make peace in the name of the missionaries, even though Tikang had obliged them to seek further satisfaction. Historian Angela Balara points out that the intermarriages between important Whakapapa lines of Hokianga and Pewhairangi was also a factor motivating resolution of this conflict, which is why I've got this slide up. Uh, to show all of those chiefs were related to each other. So the period following the death of Hongi Hike and Te Whareumu in 1828 uh, and the Paihia Missions Protector Tikoki in the year following was an unstable one. The mission even constructed a defensive fortification at the back of the settlement to ward off possible attacks. Uh, attacks from Southern Navy were especially feared. So although the missionaries brought a gospel of peace, um, they were not um, going to risk being defenceless in the face of attacks from Iwi outside the area um, with whom they had little relationship at this point. Day three. So if the Sabbath was the defining marker of the weekly cycle, then daily prayer was, I, I suggest, the defining feature of mission life. Mm -hmm. Um, Henry Williams' journal to 1840 mentions prayer three times more than it does the term Sabbath. The daily rhythm seems to have involved at least evening prayer and often morning prayer. The Anglican Book of Common Prayer prescribed, of course, a form of service or liturgy for both. And translating these two services was a priority of the mission. And the early uh, period at Pai here, it is sometimes difficult to distinguish the prayer services from family prayer. Um, in fact, before the first chapel was completed, the first permanent chapel in 1828, evening prayer seems to have been household or extended family prayer in the Beehive Fuddy with all the mission present. So on one Sunday, for example, in February 1828, around 80 Māori 
plus missionaries are crammed into the Williams and Fairburn Beehive Fuddy for family prayer. Must have been pretty hot in there. <laughs> it was in February as well. So many of the English missionaries had low church Anglican or non-conformist backgrounds. Um, the latter included the families of both Henry and Mary Ann Williams as, as they were growing up. Now, family prayer can be a serious business. Uh, Reverend David Bogue, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was the Williams family minister in the 1780s to 90s. He was an arch exponent of family prayer. When he stayed with the, the Williams, uh, Thomas Williams family in 1801, he led family prayers twice a day, delivered ex war. And unsuspecting visitors of the Williams family were caught up in these prayer observances, uh, as Uncle John Marsh reported in his typical lively style. So Mr. Pearson, a local singer, and he was a local singer and music teacher, supped with us, prayers to which Mr. Bogue said prayers, which fits the unwieldy Mr. Pearson upon his knees for a longer time than I believe he was used to. <laughs> As he told Mr. Williams the next morning, we could have excused about half the prayers. <laughs> so the descending practice of family prayer certainly was often uh, from the heart. Um, but there are many prayer books and hymnals available to be read to inspire piety. Um, and often they were these small little texts that you can see there. Um, uh, you can hold in your hand, put in your pocket, take them to church. <clears throat> so uh, it was a report of uh, Thomas Williams, Henry's father, that, that he used to read quite often at family prayers from the Bible, from Bishop Hall's Contemplations and other suitable books. It is perhaps difficult to appreciate what these new collective practices of prayer and hymn singing meant for Māori. Uh, in Christian prayer services, all ages and sexes were involved. Uh, and something like the organ, which arrived in play here, courtesy of Uncle John Marsh, who was uh, a Chichester organist, uh, became a, quite a renowned sort of um, gentleman musician. Um, something like the organ would have seemed otherworldly or that, though perhaps not in a good way. Um, so quite apart from the novel content of prayers and hymns, the, the daily communal practice of prayer and hymn singing was, I suggest, quite revolutionary. But that said, Māori took to it with alacrity. Um, Henry Williams recorded how he heard hymns from the mission hymn book put to a purely native tune when he was lying in his tent one morning. Well, he met Kaumatua, who could recite the services of morning and evening prayer by heart after only a short period. Day four, translating, catechizing, and baptizing. So translation work became a priority of the mission, um, together obviously with the language work, as Henry put it, that was its foundation, that is understanding the language. Alongside scripture portions, the catechism, hymns, the services of morning and evening prayer were among the first things translated. And candidates for baptism were, were catechized, counseled to test their understanding. They needed to profess understanding and, and a saving faith in the Eucharist before they were baptized. So Williams records, for example, in 1831, after dinner, I had some very pleasing conversation with two boys belonging to the settlement relative to baptism. Their answers were good and clear, concluded that they should be admitted to this holy ordinance in a short time. So the, the date, 23 August 1829, witnessed the first baptisms of children, of Māori children, and namely the children of Māori and Māta Taipanga, who were baptised, interestingly enough, on the same day as William Leonard Williams, uh, the future Bishop of Waiapu, after his father. These uh, baptismal records, as I'm discovering, tell very rich stories uh, of this period. Uh, if you're reading them in context. So um, San, Sunday, uh, 7 February 1830, was, I suppose, a red letter day for the mission. It saw the first uh, baptism of an adult, a Māori adult in the prime of life. A uh, few had taken previously, uh, uh, taken place previously of those nearing death. And this time it was Tai Whanga, uh, who was one of Hongi Hika's uh, war chiefs, 
a man of considerable rank, uh, as is Thamaka Proust. Um, Marion's journal testifies to the significance of his baptism uh, in Jane Austen-esque phraseology. I'm going to read this because it's one of my favourite quotes. I, I think I, for one, can say that my feelings were never so powerfully excited. I saw him, Taifunga, advance from the other end of our crowded chapel with firm step but subdued countenance, an object of interest to every native as well as every English eye, and meekly kneel where six months before we had, at his own request, stood sponsors for his four little children. I, I deeply felt that it was the Lord's doing and wonderful in our eyes. There were many other auspicious days for baptisms. Uh, on 9 August 1835, the following baptized by Henry Williams, Hemiona, Simeon, Aka of Paihia, a gentleman, native chief. That's how he's recorded, gentleman, native chief. Hamueda, Samuel, Kunoroku of Waikino, down the harbour. Honehik, um, gentleman, native chief. Honehiki of Paihia, gentleman, native chief. <laughs> Ridia Ono of Paihia, lady, native chief. That was his wife. Um, and I could go on almost ad infinitum talking about some of these significant baptisms. One was uh, in January 1840, that's about a week before the, the treaty was signed, a couple of weeks. The high ranking Hokianga Rangatira Patuoni was baptized by, by Williams with the name Edward Edwarda. His wife taking the name Lydia. Lydia. Um, so this name Lydia, or Lydia is common in the baptismal records. Uh, um, it was the name of Henry's, Henry Williams' eldest sister, and also an aunt and various other family members. So it was common for Māori, especially those of rank, um, to take the names from missionary, the missionary's family, or from European figures of status. Um, governors were quite common, believe it or not, the Australian governors, Governor Macquarie, um, and so on. Uh, chiefs. Uh, we're often baptized with their whānau and even wider hapu, and sometimes alongside um, their slaves or servants. We know this because of the column in the register, quaintly headed quality trade profession. Um, unfortunately, this column is only filled in sporadically for some periods, but what, what, what there is is insightful. By July 1840, the first Paihia Parish Baptism Register uh, recorded around 345 baptisms. By 1844, those baptisms had grown to or been added to by another thousand new baptisms. Now, I should say this doesn't include the baptisms in, at, at Kirikiri and at Waimati and at other places. This is just the Paihia ones. Um, Henry Williams performed nearly all of these baptisms, almost one baptism a day on average. Um, so, and amongst the num this number, there are quite a few missionary children, the odd Pākehā settler, even the odd, surprise me, uh, whaling captain or, or tradesman, even the infamous uh, whaling captain, Captain Brind, uh, together, great name for whaling captain, together with his high-born Māori wife, uh, Moi Waka, He'd married two high-born women, and that led into, into heaps of trouble. Um, by far the bulk, however, in these registers are, are Māori baptisms. Um, but it's really, it's really quite nice to see, particularly in the early period, the missionary kids are just mixed up with all these, these Māori names. Um, so you get Williams, Fairburn, Beer, Shepherd, uh, mixed in with Taifanga, Heke, Pata, Patu, and so on. So these baptisms, um, and quite here should be seen in the context of the total picture of Māori baptised in the decade 1832 to 43, upwards of 11,000 baptisms across all districts. Uh, quite a phenomenal, num phenomenal number, really. Um, and by 1843, um, the CMS counted or estimated at least that 35,000 Māori were attending public worship and CMS affiliated services around the country. Um, so that 
perhaps represents one third to one half of the total Māori population at the time. And that doesn't include the Wesleyan numbers and the, the uh, Kaporika numbers as well. Day five. So William Colenso's print numbers from the little pie here printing press are staggering. There was a lot of things going on at um, Pi Air Mission, including the, um, the being the centre of printing in this period. So, for example, in 1835, Colenso printed 1,000 copies of the Gospel of Luke. I'm just going to skip over some of these numbers. Uh, in 1836 to 37, 5,000 copies of the New Testament. Between 1835 to 42, I think this is a really significant figure, uh, 53,000 copies of the prayer book and 5,000 copies of the Psalms. So no wonder then that Colenso um, complained of all my ceaseless work. Um, he was re to recall later on, I may truly say that for years I never knew a day of rest, Sundays and weekdays, day and night, it was work, work, work. So some things were obviously just too important to allow a Sabbath rest, <laughs> uh, or maybe some people, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so the Pahia mission was, as well as being the printing centre, was also the distribution centre, obviously, of, of, of these uh, of these texts. Um, uh, Clenzo's print ledgers are a remarkable record of this process by which the bulk of the country was saturated in scriptures and prayer books by the mid-1840s. If you're thinking about 53,000 prayer books and, you know, compare that to the population at the time. And education was also, that is William Williams and William Colenso in older age. <laughs> he certainly wouldn't have looked like that in the 1930s. <laughs> um, but it's a pretty, pretty mean beard. <laughs> <clears throat> so I don't, don't really have time to, to, to talk about education, but the Paihia mission uh, by 1832 had had upwards of 470 Māori children enrolled at the school, um, which perhaps was 10 to 15 percent of the entire uh, Bay of Islands Māori population at the time. So also significant. Um, what I think is really significant, and when I saw this, I, I couldn't quite believe it, but um, uh, Malcolm Fulain has put together some amazing stats, <clears throat> including this table which shows that uh, by the mid-1840s, most of the teachers and the catechists uh, in the mission schools or with CMS affiliation were Māori. Mm -hmm. By 1845, um, th around 350 of Highland them at the bottom there, um, compared to a mere 30 or so on the European ledger. So in other words, there are 10 times more Māori in, in the uh, the church, the missionary church at this point, than uh, Pākehā, Royal Mission Missionaries. Okay, day six, almost there. Playing host. Uh, the mission frequently played host, whether to local rangatira, ships, captains, and in time, British resident, governor, and bishop. So breakfast for 17 um, at the Williams residence was not unusual. And often there'd be much larger groups and they would be fed with something that was called stir about because it was literally stirred about uh, in a big tub or um, cauldron, um, a mix of water and flour and sometimes sugar, um, sometimes heated up, I believe. So, so this, was, this was sent out to, to feed larger groups. And some of these occasions are, are, are quite remarkable. So I'll, just, I'll just share a couple. So um, a few weeks after, um, so in the early period, a few weeks after Mary Ann had given birth to um, Henry Jr., um, this is what she says. I just finished ironing around tea time. Henry Sr. helped me to wash the children. And overcome with fatigue, I did as I often had done before threw myself on the bed to refresh myself with a good cry. When a boat was announced and I was aroused anew to exertion to receive Mr. Mark and Mr. Kim and the celebrated Hongi to get out blankets, sheets and bedding. 
So this is what I talk about in the MADCAP nature of mission life. So the visiting party, this visiting party was accommodated in the beehive for the three principal visitors, that is Marston, Kemp and Hongi, in the sitting room. Uh, five native girls in the entrance room, four native men of the boat's crew in Mr. Fairburn's sitting room. All of these, in addition to the Fairburns, the still Mary Ann, ourselves and the children in a rush dwelling 40 feet long and 14 broad. On late, uh, in late January 1846, there was another interesting instance of a tea party. And this shows you, again, sort of what a dynamic place um, a mission station was at this period. This was only a few weeks after the last battle of the Northern War at Royal Pekapika. And the mission hosted two of the contending parties to tea, Honeyhege and a British naval captain. There was Haka from and Stir about four, the 100 men of Heke's party outside the fence, so that was sent out. Heke was invited in and had a very interesting conversation with this naval captain. Uh, Heke attended church, turned up for breakfast two days in a row, um, which was accompanied by family prayer. So that is the type of um, tea party that the mission hosted. Day seven. The Paihia mission was not only the distribution centre for scriptures, prayer books, and hymnals, it became a key departure point for both Māori and English personnel uh, taking the message of peace around the country. Released slaves increasingly became the emissaries of that uh, Te Ronga Pai. In a high profile case, a party of East Coast captives, well, many chiefs included, arrived in the bay on an English whaler and were enslaved by an Ngāpui chief. They were released uh, following persuasion by missionaries and returned to the East Coast um, at, um, about eight months later. They were meant to depart um, almost immediately, but they were delayed by a storm. And perhaps this was a providential. So they spent eight months at Pai here at the mission receiving instruction. They arrived back in Tairafti in early 1834 and were treated by their relatives as they returned from the dead. One of these returnees was a war captain back in earlier in 1823 on one of Ngāpui's southern campaigns. He doesn't feature much in the missionary accounts, but he was to lead a Christian revolution amongst Ngāti Pūrau. I'm speaking, of course, of Pirapi Taimata Akuda, who uh, one of the first things he did was announce changes to the rules of war. So, for example, no killing war captains, no cannibalism, cannibalism etc. When he um, returned to the coast, um, he, he announced, um, I have come from Kitty Kitty and from Pai here, and I have seen Williams with the four eyes. Um, and when William Williams turned up in 1839, um, Christianity had already spread through Spades uh, and you know, William's uh, brother Williams, Tepadita, recorded his amazed observations. The word has only been preached by native teachers. We had literally stood still to see the salvation of God. So, the year 1850 uh, brought news of Henry Williams' dismissal from the CMS uh, for refusing to give up his family land claims, another big story which we don't have time for tonight. Um, the Williams returned to Pākaraka uh, where their sons was, were farming. Uh, Angela Middleton states of this apparent booking uh, really, Pai here had been the, the Williams mission, she says. During the 27 years of their occupation, Pai here had been transformed from a Ngāpui kāinga into a Pākehā settlement. But I kind of ask, well, does this statement hold water? Um, the Williams were at the centre of Pai here, but many others had made their mark, including the likes of uh, Rauri Matataifanga, Oni Arudia Heke, Anahamu, William Kalenzo, a host of other English missionaries. Was it a Pākehā settlement? I think this shorthand is too easy, indeed misleading. It was a mission settlement in which Māori missionary lived together, chiefs and slaves, ordained missionary and artisan, in a community relying on collective labour and structured by daily rhythms of prayer, and mostly speaking to reo Māori. Um, it housed more Māori for its existence than it did Pākehā. It even had the odd mixed-race marriage and offspring.
the Pioneer Mission after Williams left had an afterlife. Uh, it became staffed by important Māori clergy, including the Reverend Machu Taupaki. Uh, Henry Williams recognised well before his death in 1867 that these clergy would be the hope of the church in the new era. For their part, these clergy understood the significance of the changes that had been wrought at Pai here in her sister settlements in the early mission period. Uh, when in 1876, Reverend Taupaki spoke at the unveiling of this monument from the Māori church, he chose to highlight the spiritual changes undergirding all the rest. In the presence of the aged chief, Rauri Taitwanga, uh, the Bishop of Auckland and nine Māori clergy, eight of whom were from the local Archdeacon area of Waimati, he likened the first church built at Pai here to a palisaded pa, and he stated, these are fascinating words, ko tōna pā anō tēnā e whakarite te ai ia i ngā patu o te whawhai e whakahoro i ngā pā kaha o te ao which was given the contemporary translation. It was in that fortress that he, Williams, speaking of in particular, forged the weapons of war wherewith to overthrow uh, the strongholds of the earth. So to conclude, um, underlying my narrative and analysis today have been questions over the meaning and the interaction of gospel and culture. This is a, obviously a critical tension in the history of Christianity, but not just in Aotearoa, but through the millennia. Uh, arguably, perhaps even more uh, important than institutional struggles between church and state. Um, as John H. Stenhouse wrote some years ago, secular nationalist historiography largely downplayed the role of Christianity in a project focused on the rise of a secular nation state. Uh, Tony Valentine has recently conducted a more nuanced version of what's going on and the interactions between northern missions and indigenous society. Although with a somewhat different focus from this lecture, he shows missionaries in similar ethnographic poses, observant, sometimes even analytical, in the appraisal of Maori culture, and actually surprisingly, um, often without much judgment that's visible contrary to popular stereotypes. Of course, English missionaries themselves had a culture, uh, these webs of significance in which they were suspended. Um, and it is this culture, which um, I suggest really became a hybrid Māori Pākehā culture at the mission uh, that I've been concerned to understand through analysing this week in the life uh, of the Pākehā mission. So in summary, um, can we understand this mission in terms of um, class paradigms or race paradigms, colonialist paradigms? Well, all of that is sort of in there, but I suggest that if we if we use those paradigms, we're going to obscure and distort um, the essential missionary intent of this community, its spiritual pulse, uh, and its intercultural, interracial reality. I'm with you. Uh, so. Sam, I think what we can take from that is um, the importance of living in a residential community. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> So welcome to St. John's, please, <laughs> your enrollments. Um, I thank you, Sam. We're going to have time for some kind of questions uh, from the floor. And I know there are many uh, very wise historians here that will ask you about uh, some of your historical accuracy. Um, but I'm not a historian, so I'm going to ask a different kind of question. You're writing a brief biography of Williams, I understand. And I'm sure in those moments where you're doing the research, uh, things come up for you as to what you think Henry Williams would say to us today. What would be his charge and challenge to us if he were to wrest control of the CMS today <laughs> or the mission of the church? <clears throat> what do you think he would want to point out? 
And as you answer that, think about your question. Sam, can I have time? Yeah. Well, I'm sure it'd be um, somewhat um, <coughs> amazed at what 2022 looks like. But I mean, that, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, I, I would, I would say, it would come back to. Um, and actually, Reverend Topaki refers to this in his address. Um, you know what, what, what the Great Commission was: and go ye into the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, that was essentially his heart, I think, and uh, that that I guess would still be his message. It might look quite a bit different. <laughs> it would look quite a bit different from pioneer in the nineteen twenties, eighteen twenties, but. But I think that would be that would be the essence of it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll send things and better things to say. Put like. it in the book. <laughs> Put it in the book. <laughs>